Con for letting us do this panel, and uh, but enough about me. I would, oh, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Tim Miller, Andrew Stanton, and Chaz Wachowski. You Jump. will remember this panel. You, you guys, really you will be glad you were here. <laughs> so, gentlemen, uh, I really want to say thank you for coming down to San Diego. And we're uh, not here for you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> we're here for these people. Right. Comic Con. Listen, before we get started, um, these guys have directed a number of cool things, and I want to remind everyone what they have directed. So let's take a look at a little sizzle reel. That'd be a good, yeah, that'd be a good fight. Good one. That was a good one. Uh, so you guys, uh, I think that it would be really, I, I, would, I love learning about like the behind the scenes and stuff. So what do you think fans would be surprised to learn about what it's like, like making a movie and directing in Hollywood? That's fucking hard. <laughs> now, a lot of people think, like, the young version of me used to think, like, oh, you get to be on some throne pointing while eating grapes and things get done. And it's really more like you're not, like, driving a super yacht. You're basically trying to sail while building the boat at the same time and trying to work with the prevailing winds. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of masochistic. Actually, I think you just need to ask for the grapes. I, I, I ask... <laughs> I asked for the grapes and uh what's that? Good. Good yeah. Uh pride swallowing every day. Yeah. Means to make it happen, but it you know, the heart is what makes it great. So you pull the mic a little closer to you. The heart is what makes it great. <laughs> uh, do you have any projects that came really close to filming that ultimately fell apart? <laughs> Deadpool two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, heavy metal. Yeah. I had a uh, film called Revolver that was about the Beatles that I got the rights to the songs. I even got Ethan and Maya Hawk involved yeah. and it just hit a wall. Yeah. Still hurts. <laughs> yeah, I've been up and down in Highlander I think seven times now. But we're going to make it. Oh. Wow. Make it. <laughs> the last one was, it was Ryan. It was Ryan Reynolds, right? As, I think he was... Is he still... He might have been in... Is he still nine. a tax? He was number nine? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you could get the financing to make any project or take on any IP, what would you make and why? I can't mention the first one because I'm trying to make it, and so I can't say that. But uh, Snow Crash for me. Oh, oh yeah. Actually, the two things I would want to make are actually, I found out being made. Um, the uh, trilogy, The Three-Body Problem by Xi Jin Liu. And so I got to work on that this year. And then um, there's this book from the 90s called The Sparrow by uh, Maria Dory Russell that uh, is, I found out it's getting made by some really great people, so. A little slow off the mark there, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got, a little slow. You gotta get your agents on that. I'm gonna go with Ninja Scroll. Come on, you want to see it? Yeah! But you, can, you couldn't make Ninja Scroll without everybody going, that's not fucking as good as Ninja Scroll, right? <laughs> yeah, no, there, there's a lot of risk going on. That's like when they, go, when they come and go, hey, would you be interested in Akira? I'm like, fuck no. Man. No, no, no way. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Chad, bring your mic a little closer. Just want to make sure if we can hear you. I'm going to go like that. It's really loud. Yeah. It's actually, okay. it's, it's, I get to direct a director. Wait, what? Uh, I'm around. Uh, what scroll is amazing? What if you haven't watched it? I'm so sorry. What is a detail or decision you had to fight for that you're the most proud of? Um, that uh, Buzz go into Spanish mode for Toy Story 2. <laughs> and I won that. Sorry. I won that argument. Actually, you know, I, the, on the Spanish topic, the, the, to have my actors speaking Spanish in Mexico on Terminator. They're like, well, they, they can't speak. They have, and, I'm, and I just did it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't want to, yeah, no, I, I, I would think it would have to be, I was really asked why we did the long takes in John Wick, and we just didn't want to do shaky cam. We didn't want to cover, so that was a good one. Uh, what is it actually 
you like to pitch a studio on your vision for the movie? And can you tell when you're pitching that it's going well, or can you tell it's all going bad? <laughs> we just we just had this discussion back in the, in the green room. I did a pitch at Warner Brothers, and I stopped about three minutes into it because my thing only, I can only sell to people if I think they're excited and I was getting it was like there was an energy vampire sitting across from me <laughs> and so I just at some point said look I'm trying to sell you a car and you clearly don't want to buy it so let's just end this now um, but I mean usually it's fun because you're excited about the project and you get excited about telling people about it and I always feel like you know it's a fucking genius idea so just give me the money uh, <laughs> but it's like a bar joke. If you, if you think it's really good, you're gonna tell it really well. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah, no, I that would never done well. <laughs> <laughs> we we were asked to leave. I won't mention the place, but we were told John Wick when we were pitching it wasn't a date movie. <laughs> so uh, that kind of ended the pitch right there. <laughs> yeah, five years of Fox waiting to make Deadpool. <laughs> Telling me. Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question for two from two fans. Uh, their names are Joe and Anthony. Hello, Comic Con. Anthony Russo here. Uh, Joe Russo here. Hall H, how are you? We miss you. Sorry that we cannot be there. We're releasing this year. our movie, The Gray Man, or we would be there. Uh, but we are here. We are there in spirit. We're going to ask a quick question to our very good friend Chad. Chad, tell us, you've done four John Wick films. Uh, in those four movies, which was, what was the most difficult sequence to bring to screen? What was the hardest of all of the incredible sequences you've done in those four movies to get to screen? What kept you up the longest that night? That's it. That's pretty fun. Um, wow. Let's see, uh, I'm gonna go with dogs. I'm gonna go with the dog sequence in number three, because like the dogs don't, they don't know it's a movie. They're dogs. <laughs> so it's not like if a dog can bite Halle Berry's hand, you go, hey man, that was that was a pretty good take. Man, would you mind trying it without biting the hand? Like, you just can't have those kind of discussions. So uh, it took about six months to figure out how to get the dogs to play attack instead of actually attack. And we made these, gonna be helping this one, long, green cylindrical looking pads that went onto crotches <laughs> and trained the dog to bite the green screen green and not anything that wasn't green screen green. So the, cool, the crew couldn't wear green shirts to set. Oh, so we color coded the attack and then to teach the dog to let go of said crotch when we yelled cut. It was probably a little tricky. So every crotch bite was a little nerve wracking. So I'm gonna go with that. Dude, here's my tip for you, CG dogs. <laughs> They, they do exactly what you tell them. Now they tell them. Where were you? Exactly what they tell you. Yep, and, and they don't bite your dick off. <laughs> I will say though that that dog, the dogs in, in Wick Three are incredible. And those sequences are incredible. You can bet if there's no, any dogs. No, no crotches were harmed in the filming of that scene. <laughs> if there's any dogs in Wick Four, though, they should be CG. We the the, the, vis, the visual effects supervisor that's on his on Four now was was the guy that did Deadpool, Jonathan Rothbard. Jonathan Rothbard. Yeah. So, uh, CG dog. He could do a CG dog. CG dog. Jonathan, CG Jonathan, CG Jonathan got, the, got the note. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think we have actually been practicing to be a studio executive. <laughs> Uh, we have another question from a fan. Uh, this one is named David Fincher. Yes, as a fan, I was just curious whether the rest of the panel feels strange sharing the stage with Mr. Miller when none of the promotional materials feature the word director with either an asterisk or ironic quotation marks. <laughs> Chad and I had a discussion before we came on. So how do we let this one slide? I'm gonna throw that back to you, Tim. Steve, Steve had already asked me, so it was too late. Uh, I'm gonna ask actually um, an individual question for you guys. Um, Tim, I'm gonna start with you. 
Uh, you directed Terminator Dark Fate, and I'm curious what you envision the future of the Terminator franchise to be, because it does seem like the Terminator movies have a global box office limit that averages about like 400 million a movie. So do you think the future of like another Terminator movie is maybe like a, like almost a Jason Blum-esque version where it's much smaller, more contained? Because it doesn't seem like it's ever gonna make a billion dollars. I don't like your questions. <laughs> <laughs> can I get another one? Uh, look, I, I think that, that you can make the Terminator is an interesting universe to explore. Maybe we've explored it enough. Um, I certainly thought, I went into that movie with my rock hard nerd belief. I could have said so many things. <laughs> the, uh, my nerd belief that if, if I made a good movie and I, that I wanted to see because I'm a nerd, um, it would do well. And I, and I was wrong. And I, and I you know, it was, uh, it was one of those like fucking eureka moments, but in a bad way. Uh, because the movie tanked, you probably heard that, right? Well, you see, that's what Steve's suggesting here, that the movie tanked. No, no, see, but, um, like, but, wait, 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 the movie didn't tank. Tank means it made like 20 million at the box office. Your movie made close to 300 million dollars. That's not a tank, it just didn't do... Well, then why aren't people returning my phone calls? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the question I have. Um, but, but I would say that I, 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 Jim said something at the end of it that I thought was interesting because we, it, I don't know if it's a fair comparison because we went back to an R-rated movie and Jim said he thinks that the previous PG-13 rated movies kind of hit a weakness in the franchise. Um, and when we went back to R thinking we were so cool, um, it, it just shows that it needed a wider audience to support it. But I definitely think you can make a, a lower cost Terminator movie and it could be awesome because yeah. um, a good director and talented movie stars can make anything great, you know? It could be sock puppets. They would do a, they do a great job. We did do a sock puppet opening for Girl with the Dragon Tattoo that I'm gonna put up on. <laughs> it's, it's fucking brilliant. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think, I think you, you could. Whether or not that's a good use of talented people's time when there's so much Terminator movie out there. I'd like to do a Terminator CG. But... You, have, you have a little bit of experience with something called Love, Death, and Robots. Yeah. You know, uh, Chad, a lot of people don't realize you were Keanu Reeves' stunt double on um, the Matrix movies. Many, uh, many, 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 many years ago. And, but also, I mean, you've been stunt coordinator, you were stunt coordinator on the sequels, you've worked as a stunt coordinator on tons of movies. How did that actually uh, shape you as the filmmaker you are today? And do you have any, like, stories from some of the ones you worked on that you might want to share with nobody recording? <laughs> Many. Motivation. Stay in school, kids. Don't be a stuntman. Uh, getting hit by buses is a terrible waste of your mind. Um, no, it's great. You got CG. the CG industry. <laughs> CG, you don't have to do that anymore. Let me tell you where CG was 20 years ago. <laughs> Fred Flintstone, dude. <laughs> Wasn't quite buying it back then. Uh, no, I gave you an inside scoop on what was going on. You got to work with all the departments. You got to see filmmaking from the trenches. You got to meet all the incredible cast. You got to learn how to act. You got to be on camera. I mean, you really, you know, got to got to be inside and see how the sausage was made. I mean, it was a fantastic experience. You get to perform. You get to double some of the best actors on the planet. Um, you know, it's like mind and body. You got to test them both. Um, I remember the, my first big movie. I was friends with Brandon Lee. So my first big movie was Dublin Brandon on the Crow, which was amazing. Oh man! Um, and then I got to, you know, less than two years later, I was auditioning for the first Matrix. The guy I was working for, the stunt I was working for at the time, came up to me at like 9 a.m. I had just done a car hit for a TV show. <laughs> I still had blood dripping down me. And he's like, hey, it's Keanu Reeves guy. You know him. I'm like, yeah, yeah, i seen Speed. It's great. He's like, well, they're doing this sci-fi kung fu movie, and I hear you do kung fu. I was like, okay. He's like, you should go to Burbank. They got auditions at noon. I'm like, okay. So I drive over. I show up, and there's all these Chinese guys flipping and flying. And then there's the Wachowskis that walk over, you know, looking homeless. And then they're like, hi, this is Keanu, and I met him, and then they're like, okay, follow the little Chinese guy. And for the next hour and a half, I flipped, landed on my head. I think I concussed myself several times. Um, anyways, they gave me the job, don't know why, probably the tallest white guy that they could find. And then they sent me over to Australia, and I get there, my first, my first sequence is the government lobby. 
And if you guys remember the guy with yeah. Bobby, he's got to do a little cartwheel, pick up the gun. Well, in the script, it was a little pistol. And on the day, they're like, no, use the big heavy rifle. <laughs> and they had about a thousand squibs going off, the explosions. And I remember at the time, a very famous, flamboyant, and confrontational producer named Joel Silver, Uncle Joel, came up to me. I've never met the man before, but he was every bit larger than life and said, don't miss the fucking gun. <laughs> and yeah, so I don't know what I was doing. It was pure luck. I grabbed the gun, and that's what's in the movie. And that, that made me shake for about a minute. I have, I have two follow-up questions. Uh, why? On any of the John Wick movies, did you did you say at any point, look, just let me do it. Just let me get in there. And like, you push the stunt double out and I never do it. said it. You I must have. <laughs> you but must have done it at least once. In my mind, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna still 25 in my mind. Yeah. I actually don't know that. But like, then I got smart again, I let the stunt double do it. And number two, what was the worst stunt injury you saw in your career? Oh, yeah. Saw or experience? Take your pick. Which one's Thompson? <laughs> You're still here, so we know you it too That's bad. <laughs> That's the biggest fucking trainer. Um, oh, God. Uh, un unfortunately, I, I was present for, you know, the fatality, and I was present for myself in Ben Badwoods. But, uh, yeah, I can still walk, it's cool. <laughs> CG. <laughs> Bad career choices. Uh, he's artificial from the waist down. Chad, I have a follow-up, actually. Uh, yeah. How did all of your stunt work in directing help you to play Chad Woo! in The Matrix Resurrections and Carrie oh, Ann Moss's husband. Handsome Chad. You guys didn't see that movie, did you? Yeah. <laughs> no, it was uh, Lana's a sweet girl. I mean, I owe most of my career to, to the Wachowskis and going to film school, literally working 10 years straight with them. So when we got the call to do Matrix 4, um, you know, she wanted to do it like a love letter and a big, big thing for us to bring back all the crew from all the original Matrixes and I don't know why, but put us all on camera. So a lot of the characters in the movie are, are department heads and people that worked on the movie from VFX to first ADs to, to myself to some people. And I was, I said, sure, like when I'm on a call, like all my career to us, I said, whatever you need, sure, it's gonna be great, no problem, thinking it would be something like hi. It was not. So I showed up and they handed me the size, I'm like, there must be some mistake, there's like four pages here. Maybe it was, no, there was a little print. So I showed up and I kind of read it. I'm like, okay, I got this. I'm a big director. I was a stunt guy, no problem. I showed up on set. I'm supposed to walk in with a croissant, be Carrie Ann's husband, and Keanu comes up and I got there. I'm like, holy shit, that's Keanu Reeves and that's Carrie Ann Ball. <laughs> and they start staring at me. I'm like, and I'm like, oh, fucking talk, talk. Hurry up and say something. <laughs> I'm like, oh, honey, we got, and it was a catastrophe. And then the second take where I actually said something, I knocked over the croissants in back of me or the teacups in back of me. I was a fucking wreck. I, I just, no cool whatsoever. Anything that I had confidence directing went out the window. But I think creative editing, CG. Here's a little, here's a little industry tidbit. When you, when you have a stunt guy act, it's called stack D. <laughs> it's true. Or, or, yeah, that's too much stack D. Or if you have a stunt guy hand standing around like too long, he waits for the punch, it's called having, it's got too much egg on it. Or I love all those little... Yeah, we have a lot of stunt, stunt euphemisms. Yeah, cinematographers are, the, they have the most, like, I, I don't even understand what the fuck they're saying. Well, oh, I keep about. notes all the yeah, time. Yeah, I was in Britain once and they asked, give me a Phil Collins. And I was like, what is that? It's a small white square. <laughs> yeah, they got, yeah. yeah. And, and, and for, for a flag. And, and honestly, six years ago, like half of what they said couldn't be repeated. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Andrew, uh, I, I really enjoy John Carter. And I... Yeah. Uh, oh, I can hear the song. Okay. Uh, so, what would you like, I don't know, would you maybe tell us a little bit about what you would have done if you had made John Carter sequels? Sure. I'll tell you the other two movies. I like it. All right, what do we got up here? Eventually there's going to be something, maybe, there we go. There we go. Brought my cheat sheet, so I won't forget. So, we actually, you know, they, they mapped Mars during the first movie with the rovers and stuff, so we got the actual topography of Mars. Oh, wait, there's another image of the map. And we put all the locations that were in the first movie and would be in the second and third movie everywhere on the map. And we had it all figured out. But don't worry, I'm not going to read all this. This is just for you to not forget. But Gods of Mars, 
John Carter was going to be, he was on Earth for 10 years. His wife Deja had their baby while he was gone. Gets kidnapped by the villain, Manti Shang. Carter arrives back on Mars to discover Deja has gone back down the river, is convinced it will lead her to the Therns and their stolen child. Carter reunites with Tars Tarkas, Willem Dafoe's character. They follow her down the river where they discover an underground city with complete modern technology run by a race called the Firstborn. And they're technologically advanced beyond here or Mars. And they've been managing the planet's existence since the beginning. Water, air, food, plants that eat you. And they're also zealots, zealots that worship the goddess Isis, who exists in person. But this goddess is actually our shape-shifting villain, Matai Shang. That's his day job. And as you might expect, Carter will reveal Matai is a false god to the firstborn, track down his son, turn out to be this superhuman warrior that was ordered to kill Carter. Matai had genetically advanced the baby to an adult age, and he nearly kills his own son. And all this comes to a climax as the helium air fleet, led by Woola, his pet, descend down a dormant volcano to rescue our heroes. And Carter, Deja, and his man-child son are reunited. And the three races, the red, the green, and the firstborn, are now chasing the Therns out of there. And that's the end of the second movie. The third movie, Warlord of Mars. I, I, I can stop for you a second. You have been killing me. I would have liked to have seen that. Okay, yeah. Go. But the third movie, you got the Therns are the Nazis on the run now. They've hidden themselves at the northern pole of Mars, where the original copies of their bodies are stored. And it's time to evacuate completely and occupy Earth, and they're going to shut down Mars so nobody can live on it and it's a giant ticking clock, and the world will end if Carter can't track down the Therns and kill them before they kill the planet. So to buy themselves time, these shape-shifting Thern spies keep posing as other leaders of Martian races and cause infighting and chaos, like, much like Putin and bots right now. And Martians are too busy fighting themselves to focus on uniting and eradicating the Therns, and meanwhile, scientist Deja has invented a device to detect these Therns, but the spies destroy it, and they assassinate Carter. And that's when we remind the audience it was just a copy. His original body wakes up on Earth. There's Thurn Pinkertons there ready to kill him, but Edgar bought a shotgun and he kill uses it correctly and kills him. Carter returns to Mars, but keeps his existence a secret. And while the threat of the world war rises on, him, his wife, and his son, with their one surviving Thurn detector prototype, go up to the top of the world following the Thurn trail, where he finally faces off with our villain Mantai Shang, and of course, as you would expect, he stops the Thurns, saves the planet, and is given the official title, Warlord of Mars. There you go, there was the trilogy you never got. And you know, you know how he's going to get it all done? See, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you, did you, real Nazis? Were you, I thought that was no, a joke. No, no, CG Nazis. Uh, no, no, but real Nazis, like, it advances to the... Oh, I don't know, that would have been cool. Oh, I, or you, you were joking, you were I like, was joking, that was a reference. Oh, okay. Okay. I love these books, I read all these books. <laughs> so I, yeah. Uh, we have... Uh, do two, it! <laughs> do it! Do it. We have two... They're public domain now, Andrew. I know, you can do it. Yes, because I, I... You could do it at your own I'm like, fuck, we should do it. We should do it. He's like, with the public domain, you can do it if you want. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'll take that Pepsi challenge. <laughs> <laughs> with him, I mean, who wouldn't... I didn't really follow that story, but I could put it on the sound, right? If you got two hours... for you guys, it wasn't yeah, for you. Oh, uh, yeah. If it's a series on a streamer, that's a lot of plot. That was a lot of plot. It's a series. It need to be a season. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're going to do it four by three. <laughs> but let's take half the rendering. <laughs> we have two more fan questions, but because the fan questions are so similar, I decided to put them together. You'll know who they are. <laughs> so, my question is what is the best directing tip you've ever received? Thank you. Uh, I know the best acting tip I've ever received. Don't take the call from Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, well, there's, a, there's another one. There. One more? Yeah, there's a, another. Hello, Comic Con. This is Guillermo Montoro. And uh, uh, I was wondering uh, for the panelists. Um, if I could ask uh, from Tim, what is the most useful and practical uh, piece of the advice you've ever had? 
Mine was very simple. Jim Cameron said to me. So going down the line, what is the best advice you've gotten? Uh, Ignorance is confidence. <laughs> uh, mine was from George Miller. He said, plan for every, uh, plan the shit out of stuff and then just be prepared to throw it all out on the day. But if you don't do both, you're, you're screwed. Um, I think mine was actually from uh, the editor of uh, both Deadpool and uh, Terminator, Julian Clark, when we go to test the film. But it kind of applies to everything in hindsight. When you're getting comments and notes from people and you start showing it, he said, look for the patterns. Any individual comment could be taken as somebody's opinion or you know from left field, but you'll find the problems with what you're doing if you look for the patterns. People say it more than once, different people point it out, and it's really useful um, if, if any director is afraid to listen to people, um, people's feedback. Um, I don't think they should be allowed to direct in the future because we're making it for people to watch. And, yeah, I don't have all the answers, so great advice. Um, people always talk about the bad notes of Hollywood. I'm curious, what's a note you've gotten from a studio exec or somebody uh, that it was a really great note that helped you? And do you have any examples of really bad notes that you want to share? <laughs> uh, I was was suggested that we cut the mutant toys out of Toy Story, uh, and so of course we didn't take that. But the good advice I got, and it was suggested for a while before I listened to it, was I used to have the entire tragedy uh, of, of Nemo of, that begins the story. It used to be doled out in flashbacks throughout the entire story, and you slowly solve the mystery. And uh, and once I finally took their advice and listened and put it all up front and told it linearly, of course the end result worked much better. That's funny because the, I had the opposite happen. They made me do a linear cut of mm. Deadpool, and uh, and I said we didn't. It was never. We never shot it that way. It was not planned to be that way. And they made me do it anyway. And then they looked at it and said, "Okay, yeah, put it back." <laughs> uh, but but we but we the tragedy is you had to waste time um, doing it. I'll, I'll tell you that on Deadpool, uh, if you've seen the movie, the 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 first uh, the first time. Uh, in the script originally from five years when I worked on it, Ajax gets beat up in the big firefight and he goes to prison. And then the next five years is Deadpool waiting for his, him becoming Deadpool, waiting for him to get out of prison. That's the way we shot it. Um, but it, it never played right. And then Simon Kimberg um, in the edit room one day just said, what if he doesn't go to prison? And Deadpool's hunting him. And I just said, fuck. <laughs> fuck me. It was the it was the most embarrassing uh, thing because I literally six years of my life looking at the script, thinking about it, changing the commas, um, and <laughs> and, I, and I just missed this gigantic fucking thing, um, which fixed which fixed a big problem with the movie actually. Oh no, I think it was on the the first John Wick we had uh, Keanu open a, a letter from the puppy, and we had done a bunch of flashbacks and stuff, and like you know just stay on. Stay on the character, stay on Keanu, let him cry. It's an action movie, we want to see him cry, and I think that's what really gave the movie a standout. Or it's separated from just every other shoot up kind of movie, is, you know, Keanu's brave enough to emote, let him cry, stay in it, and, and feel it. Some, I heard somebody else gave me that advice, or at least I read it, was whenever you feel like staying cut, saying cut, let it go let another go. 10 let seconds. It just let it go. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It also it reminds me of like one of the things I always learned while shooting is everybody on set is worried about everything but what the actors actually do. Like everybody's worried about costume, lighting, or you know, framing and all that stuff. So I've learned just pay attention to the eyes of who we're shooting because when you're watching stuff, that's all you do. And yet it's the last thing anybody's doing on set. I do this thing that I was told a lot of directors don't do. I watch and I write down notes while I'm watching for each thing, and then I run out around. I keep the monitors like really close to the actors, and then I run out and I go, okay, um, Linda, you come in a little slower. Arnold, yeah. you just shut up for a second, and uh, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna, you know, and then and then I run back behind the monitor.
chapters because but if I didn't write it down yeah I would forget I would get out there and go oh. my problem is I can't read my own writing so I just, <laughs> I don't know. it's terrible I I have I have a stack of the sides from every day of Terminator Deadpool and they're just covered with like notes from from all the takes um, it's it's cool I often sit alone at night and relive <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. I go, oh my god. Pages of regret. Yeah. Uh, we have another fan question. This one is from uh, someone named Willem. Ah. I'm Willem Defoe, and I worked with Andrew on Finding Nemo and also John Carter. My question is what is the difference between directing animation and directing live action? Give him hell, Andrew. Well, it's basically directing animation. You can correct me. It's doing. It. I don't think I can. I don't. It's doing I don't it in slow I... motion. It's like it's basically it's all the same decision making, but separated by meetings between months. So like the five things you would say on set in an hour happen over a month in five different meetings. <laughs> so the, the the collective power that you have to have of like holding a vision and then following that note through is at this weird insanity level. Uh, but uh, basically, you, it, you still have to figure out where, where am I gonna put the camera, what, what, what's gonna happen in the frame, what's the motivation, what are the marks? It's just to a lot of different people instead of one person or 10 people right there on the day. That's about the biggest difference I can think. I, it's less stressful. <laughs> <laughs> animation. I, yeah, yeah, animation is a lot less stressful. I, I think you have a lot more control. You know, Fincher did uh, one of the uh, bad traveling for this season of Little Death and Robots, and, and and he just said it's just the amount of control that you have to you know adjust uh, performances relative to each other. You can have dogs in the set and they don't <laughs> cause problems. Uh, you can, you know, there's just so many things you can do. Uh, that, the, the way I put it is like they, they're both writing music. One is like a symphony that you spend years just trying to get it just right and then finally the orchestra plays it if you get the money. And then the other one is jazz and you're just basically ripping that and improv But Oscar Peterson and Mozart each do masterpieces so it's, it's just, it's a different beast. Uh, I'm curious what you got, what it is like working with the marketing department when you're promoting a big movie, because a lot of us here at Comic-Con, we're all diehard fans, and we watch a ton of trailers, and we get disappointed when we see a lot of the best stuff in the trailer, but, like, the truth is, the trailer is aimed at someone who goes to the movies every once in a while, you're trying to make the, the one time they go in six months your movie. So what is it like working with the marketing department, deciding what shots are gonna go in the trailer, how much you wanna give away? You get beaten down. <laughs> you know, you start going, well, how many spoilers am I willing to give up? Just please, I'll, I'll give you these two if you don't give the other one. The other thing I've learned is that whatever was really inspiring you to even make the movie and pitch it to yourself and to somebody else, it's probably the very same thing that it's gonna be what makes it interesting at the end of the process. And uh, so I always now learn to take notes at the front end about why did I like this, what was like intriguing about it, so that I have like a little bit of objectivity. Because you lose all objectivity. One of the weird things is that I went on YouTube to watch like some of my favorite movie trailers that I clearly had seen in the 70s, 80s. They gave away everything. So clearly it's always been happening. Well, they, they've done studies, which is shocking that people like it better if they know the plot of the movie going which in. Kills you and it's like, which, but how do you fight that <laughs> that logic? You might go, hey, I don't enjoy gravity, but uh, the, so you know, so you have to you have to go along with it. You go, I, I got to tell people enough so that they know what they're getting into. So you feel comfortable. But it's also the level of confidence with the students. They know they have something good. I mean, I, I can only speak. These guys have worked a lot of different studios, but. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to talk to him. With Lionsgate, when you have, oh, they were, you know, it was trying to get the movie out in the first place, trying to get the, the franchise going, but like, you know, as we progressed, they get more and more confident with the franchise, so they, you know, they try to get it out, we try to show what's bigger and better about it, but like, you know, I've been on both sides of the line, it's like your baby, you don't want to show too much, 
And at the same time, you want people to go see your movies. So you're trying, you're trying to hey, please go see my movie, but you, you don't want to show the best stuff, but you want to show enough stuff to get in the seats. You know, to answer your question, Steve, like you know, I'm on my fourth one, and I still don't, I don't know the balance, man. It kills me every time we go through it, but I'm happy people go see it. So, I, I, I feel like I don't know enough, so I generally trust. Them. I mean, on Deadpool, Brian in the marketing department just fucking killed it. Um, it, was, it was like the best marketing experience I could have, but I didn't have fuck all to do with it. Um, they, it was just a gift because I didn't know what what we're doing. But I definitely see the 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 value of marketing it. Love Death and Robots is a good example where we just got to get the word out. We just have to have people come and watch the show. The, the show will take care of itself, but if people aren't aware of it, if they don't want to come see it, then they'll never find out how great it is. Uh, the next fan question comes from someone named Joel. <laughs> so, my question is, why is it so hard directing while being a redhead? <laughs> yeah. That was Oh, that oh, wasn't, sorry, that wasn't the question. Oh, the, the question was, uh, what's the difference of directing TV and movies? Okay, that's, that's my question to you, Andrew. What's the difference between directing TV or movies? Heard you the first time, Joe. <laughs> Go back to animation, right? <laughs> but the big difference is that when you're filming a, a movie, that's your restaurant and you own it, you're the chef. TV, the showrunner, the creatives, it's their restaurant, and usually it's almost like a franchise because there's so many episodes, and you're just a guest chef cooking their meal. Or a better analogy is like you're a session player coming on their album. I was gonna say fry cook. <laughs> but you didn't. It, it, Some days it's like that. Is there a TV show that, Andrew, you've done a whole bunch of, you've done uh, Stranger Things and For All Mankind, and, yeah. uh, but uh, for Tim and Chad, are, is there a TV show that if they called you and said, you know, would you like to direct an episode, you would be like, F yeah. Love, Death, and Robots. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about it. You're gonna, no, I'm not gonna say it. I've, I've gone to the joke too many times. Uh, you know, I, w I was going to direct the pilot of Ultra Carbon, um, and then and then Fox said you're going to go do Deadpool too, uh, and then I said, no, I'm not. Uh, eventually, but if, yeah, I would love to do it. But I actually, I'd, l I'd like to know from Andrew because I, I just don't see. I don't understand how you guys shoot so fast in TV. Uh, that's why I did it. I want to know if all my heroes are doing this and they're pulling it off, and it's like, oh, it's just really fucking hard. Yeah, how do you shoot an episode of Game of Thrones in, in it, it's, it's 20 days? I don't. Here's one thing: you, you, you don't. There's no playback. You mean you don't look at it? You, there's no playback. Oh, really? You're like basically old school. You're like what you see, and you. And I gotta tell you, after a while. You get used to it because I went just did a show in Europe where they do have playback on TV, and I found myself not using it because I got so used to like I got to be where the camera is, I got to be right where the actor is, and you you're like you go to this extra sensory level that you just have to because now is it. Oh man! And you're well, basically and you're in Clint mode. You you do like two takes and you move. Is that why there's so many Starbucks cups? <laughs> Pretty much, I bet. But, but no, it's, it, it's, it, you can move that fast. It's kind of insane. I don't think Clint only does two takes because of that. <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I could do that. I got to I mean, you're there. I just wanted to be you're able to know I could that's do it. the only time you're going to be there, and you got to, how do you know that, okay, I got it. I can. Well, I got to also say, like, it's, there's something to be a gun for hire. It's just you don't carry that psychological pressure that it's all Oh, I get it. The trick is to not give a shit. <laughs> that's, that's you give saying. a shit about your episode. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't give a shit about the entire franchise. <laughs> I got to get more into you. You know what? Let's, can we all just collectively agree to forget that moment because we want Andrew to work again. <laughs> We want him to continue directing. He does. He cares deeply about the success of the franchise. Let me assure every. <laughs> because Stranger Things needs all our help. 
<laughs> please, kid. Yeah. yeah, please help that show. Just not a fucking Stranger Things. Love Death and Robots comes out. Stranger Things a week. A week. Well, whose decision was that? Week. Not mine. <laughs> I'm gonna say David Fincher. <laughs> uh, jumping into, we have a few more things to get through. Uh, next question comes from David and DB. Oh. <laughs> Our question is, how do you personally prepare for a shoot? How do you do it? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Speaking of Starbucks, go. <laughs> So real quick, because it's only the end of it. They know. They're good guys. They was some good stuff. I, I, I'm going to say that the, this, I'm sorry for saying this, but the, except for this last season of Game of Thrones, it's an exceptional show. It's just, it's so they're, I'm, I'm, they're two of the smartest guys I've ever met, and they're great people to work with. I'm doing the three-body problem with them, and they're, they're fantastic. So real fast. Um, but, but here's what you prep for. You poop before call time. <laughs> I don't want to carry that load on the set. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Uh, we are, that is, I've, I've asked this question before. I've never gotten that answer. That's, that's a real answer. That's money in the bank. There's the secret <laughs> right there. Uh, I'm going to just move on. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, the there's, next, there's so many things you do. I mean, it's prep is a, a, a quite a long time. Um, so you, there's, there's a million things that you have to answer questions on. There's people that say, oh, people can only answer X amount of questions. You can only have X amount of decision-making uh, bandwidth every day. They, they are not directors because it's, it's just non-stop it's questions. Infinite. You what want red that? instead of blue. Should you stand anyone. here and there? Should you be, yeah. You can, the, the trick is give an answer. You can change your mind later. <laughs> I thought mean, the trick was to not give a shit. That was, <laughs> yeah, that's that's, a, just that's stand the first there. course of action. <laughs> Uh, uh, Jeff Jeff Fowler, who's the director of Sonic, it's probably here right now. Jeff, where are you? J Jeff <laughs> Jeff Jeff always said um, Tim Miller frequently wrong but never in doubt. <laughs> <laughs> which, 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 you might have been favorite. Somebody once told me like there's always going to be a point during a movie where the the crew goes, "Where's the land? We don't see the land." And you just gotta go. It's that point, way. Just point. <laughs> just keep going. Yeah. Be confident. Point. Yeah. Conversely, we shot a scene on Terminator that I didn't believe in, but I, I had to shoot it. And I got up in front of the crew and I said, at the beginning of the day, I said, "So, I hate this scene. <laughs> I don't believe in it. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. Um, and I don't think it'll ever be in the movie. But I'm going to do the best I can." to shoot it. And then I went back to the tent and someone who was there said, that is the worst fucking piece of leadership I have ever seen <laughs> in, in my entire life. But my, my rationale there was, I've been working with these people and if they know it's shit too, because they're all very smart, very talented people, and if I don't say it's shit, then they question my judgment and they don't believe me. It's, you gotta say it, you gotta, you gotta be honest. It's, I actually, uh, speaking of uh, Terminator, um, except uh, to actors, sometimes you have to lie. <laughs> the actors. I'm kidding. Am I kidding? No, I'm not. No. Well, let's just say sometimes you have to, you know. Not lie. <laughs> speaking of uh, Terminator, uh, I think we have something from Arnold. Hey, Kamal Khan, how are you guys doing? Oh, Tim, I have a question for you. I mean, how much did Linda Hamilton actually pay you for not having me show up until the second act of Terminator 6? First of all, Terminator 6. Huh? Um, not enough. Next question. <laughs> the three of you, what has actually been like the biggest pinch me moment of your career? Um, biggest pinch me moment of your career. Oh my god. It wasn't when you were cartwheeling with a gun? Yeah, probably I was up in the air going, oh shit. Um, <laughs> I can't believe I made that decision. No, nah, it was uh, first time we did Wake, first movie, no one really heard of it. I think we're in Fantastic Fest in Austin, and I was sitting next to Keanu. Yeah, great place, right? Uh, 
we had our little bowl of popcorn and we had snuck in and the movie ended and it was silence and everybody started clapping. I was like, we looked at each other, holy shit, they're clapping. And I'm like, we didn't know why. And then, uh, we really didn't. And then all of a sudden they started clapping. We're like, oh fuck, they're clapping at the movie. And that was like, wow, we just made the movie. That was like, that was pretty cool. I, I think, I mean, there's so many. I'm like the luckiest nerd in, uh, in, in the world. But honestly, I think it was right here on the stage. When, when Deadpool, sorry, I get a little checked out. When, when, uh, you know, you guys, you were here. Some of you were probably here. No, when, when the people said play it again, man. <laughs> Real fast, uh, I cry a lot. Oh, right. no, I like that. It's that people don't realize when Deadpool was coming out, wasn't like the expectation for opening weekend like twenty million dollars? No, it was forty-five. Right. And so, what did it make opening weekend? One hundred and forty. Right. So in Hollywood, that just doesn't happen. You know what I mean? It, it's yeah. And I was with a bunch of Fox executives at the time too, and they couldn't believe it. They're just like, what? <laughs> and I was like, what? Uh, I'm on the river in Lake Powell, shooting on John Carter, shooting exactly where Taylor, London, and Dodge in their lifeboat had just watched the Liberty One sink in the 1968 Planet of the Apes. And I'm like, there's a pinch me. I was like, I'm, I'm part of history here. This is awesome. Sci-fi history. It was awesome. Uh, we have another uh, fan question. This one is from, I believe, Eric. Uh, hello, I'm Eric Powell, creator of The Goon. I have a question for Tim Miller. Uh, I was just wondering, is it true that James Cameron smells of jasmine and can eat a pound of hot dogs in a sitting? Is it true that James Cameron took a collection of turn-of-the-century erotica down to the Titanic in his bubble machine. Is it true that James Cameron has front row seats to every Blink-182 concert? Is it true that James Cameron likes a Gungum style? Is it true James Cameron started COVID because he hates people that aren't blue? <laughs> that guy agrees. Oh, follow-up question. What's up with the Goon movie? Uh, so, you guys are the first to learn, except the people that donated the Kickstarter because we know, we put it there. Um, the Goon is going to Netflix. Uh, so, how, how long have you been working on this? We, oh my God, twelve years, fifteen years. We are very excited. Um, Netflix wants to do the movie. Um, they're great. We've worked with Love, Death, and Robots with them. I couldn't think of a better partner. Uh, and we're very happy to do it. Patrick Osborne is directing. Patrick's won an Academy Award. Um, he did uh, uh, Love, um, Three Robots for this season of uh, Love, Death, and Robots, which is really great. He's a super great guy, very smart, very collaborative. Uh, and he and Eric are busy working on it right now. It's gonna be great. I thought that you guys should hear it first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I did not get permission to say that, so I could be in big trouble. He, so me and Andrew will be uh, <laughs> phoning it in. <laughs> but he's not joking. He, I didn't ask permission. No. Yeah. So Netflix, please don't be mad. <laughs> I'm saying great things. I'm very excited about the movie. I, it's going to be great. Uh, but real quick, what is it like actually making a film that has built-in fans? Uh, can you sort of talk a little bit about that? Because you've all taken in, like, you know, once you have a fan base, what is it like actually dealing with it? Humbling to be there. Uh, every time we open a John Wick, you guys have been great. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. So. Go ahead. Uh, I've made a career out of ignoring everything else and just doing whatever we thought was Right, and that seems to be the best way to honor it, is just to make the best thing possible. So, that's about what I've done strategy-wise. I, I loved it until Terminator. 
And, and look, I think that I, I love the fans. I am a fan. Um, I think some of the top toxic um, conversations around filmmaking or properties or whatever gets a little difficult sometimes to to not just the filmmakers because whatever we can take it. Um, I just I feel sorry that the conversation goes that way because <clears throat> you love these things and that's why you do this. See, I cry easy, right? <laughs> I know this is not my wife is so embarrassed, uh, but no. But you you do these things because you love them and you want to have a conversation about them. And it just didn't used to be this shitty. Um, and and so I actually want to engage with the fans. I want to talk about it, but it just gets it turns nasty so often. And I just wish it wasn't like that because I love I love making these things, and um, I wish everybody could have a, a, a productive conversation about it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, so I'm just going to throw this out there. Um, we might have an in-person question from someone named Jay Utah. I'm not. I'm not sure if we actually do. Do we? Oh, what, what's happening? See you, Mr. Sir. See you, Steve. Before I crash this party with all the fucking awesomeness that you guys are sharing. Please do. Uh, so uh, they threw me out here. Sorry to, you know. I'm going to cry again. Uh, big... um, so uh, I bring some uh, John Wick 4 swag. So excuse us. Uh, we have, um, so. For everyone who's here right now, on your way out, we have a uh, John Wick 4. Oh yeah, cool. Guys, you guys, you guys get one of those. Um, Steve, what's what do they have on the back of it? On the yeah, there's a, there's a QR code on the back of the poster that you should pay attention to. Did you sign it? I I didn't sign all of them. I I, I signed some of them. I was, I, I'm sorry. I couldn't sign them all. I had to get you. Uh, and then uh, question. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, so one of the things about the first three John Wick films. It takes place mostly in New York, and one of the things that I think is very exciting about the fourth one is it's international. So, can you guys sort of talk about the locations where it take, you know, where the sequel takes place? Yeah, we have five countries. We got five: Japan, Japan, Jordan, Jordan, America, America, Berlin, Berlin, France. Wait, that's me. You mean Germany? <laughs> yeah, Germany. I, I went to an American high school. <laughs> Okay. So it's well, um, France. France, Paris. Yeah. That's in France. It's been really cool, actually. It was really fun to uh, to bring with international and um, yeah. So we have. Um, if it's okay, fellas, I'm sorry to like jump Wick this. Please. But uh, we have. Um, we got a little, uh, teaser trailer. <laughs> The footage or the amount of bass. <laughs> it's that sonic right. <laughs> Did you feel the amount of bass? This whole fucking song. Yeah. We want to shake. Yeah. That's awesome. That's why I like movies. Look at me. Can I, just, can I ask real quick though, the ending of that footage when you have the guy's head down with the nunchucks going again and again and again, whose idea was that? What is it like to film? I don't, we don't sleep much. A lot of nunchucks. We love nunchucks, right? Yeah. Why don't you just like to torture your lead character? I do. I mean, you guys can speak about that. I mean, isn't there, you know, in all of your films, there's this idea of, of suffering. Yeah, of suffering, right? And overcoming, yeah. right? You learn more through Nobody it. wants to see a story about the happy village. <laughs> happy, unless it's a musical, right? <laughs> happy 
village, we're all together. Welcome to our town. <laughs> Steve called me a little earlier today and he goes, this fucking footage, man, what did you see? At the end, he said, he hit the guy with a nut shot over and over again. Yeah, it's amazing. He's like, I gotta admit, I have chills. Yeah. I mean, Love, Death, and Robots really uh, come sends on, out man. some of so, Thank you, guys. Yeah, man. All of the filmmakers and, and Steve, for you too, communicating. You know, just <laughs> storytelling. You know, and, the, and, the, and, and what's, I don't know, but also the ambition, what's behind it, right? Even if it's, you know, an action movie or entertainment or animation, there's no even in that. You know, it's like big picture and humanity and all of your works of art communicate that and, and you help us talk about that. So, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm, I'm very thankful to be on the stage with all of you guys. And Keanu, you have directed as well. So, whatever man of Tai Chi Kung Fu movie. Yeah. It's awesome. Anyway, 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 thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me, uh, you know, jump out and let you guys pull this up. Chad, I actually do have a question. So, one of the things that I really can't imagine, because each John Wick movie really has some very impressive action set pieces, and I am curious how the fourth one, what you've done on this one that maybe is different than the previous ones. Did you work with different stunt people? What, what can you tease people about it? Uh, I think we have our core team from 87 11. I think those guys are in the audience right now, somewhere, right? 87 11. Jimmy and Marina, stand up. That's the martial arts choreographer for the Dynamics Tour. David Camarillo, stand up. That's Keanu's trainer for one of us jiu-jitsu guys on the planet right now. We're the guys who put together all the choreography in the movie. So every movie we try to go up, we try to do something a little different, but it's also our, we can't change without the cast members changing. So the better Keanu gets, the more he's willing to endure, the more skill sets from horse, cars, motorcycles, martial arts, the better he gets, the better movies get. It's that simple. The better we get our cast, the better we are our stunt teams, the more effort they put in, the better we get. And that's what it comes down to. Good people get good stuff. Well, if I can do a follow-up, if you don't mind, with the third movie, you trained the dogs for, I think, six months or a year. Yeah, you they were easier to train than most of the stunt guys, but yeah. <laughs> The thing about it is that people, for people that don't realize, it is so long to train for some of these movies. Yeah. For Wick Four, can you sort of talk about like how long do people, tr how long did people train to do stuff in it? I think we were running ideas literally after the first. I mean, after John Wick Three wrapped, we were already starting to come up with new ideas and conceptualize. So, to get all the numbers to get stuff, I think Keanu, or was it, I think he trained for about six months. But that's quite a bit of time between. Um, the movie has a big driving sequence in it that was all piano. So just to, to train in the vehicles and not, you know, it's a little different punching and kicking nunchucks than 60 mile an hour drifts through traffic. So that, that took a little bit of time. And then we have a horse sequence which took a little bit of time. But uh, development, the training the people, I think, is just time and effort. But conceptualizing takes a long time. And we were talking to Andrew before, <laughs> like we really. We don't show you all the mistakes, you know what I'm saying, but like we're training every day and we probably throw away 90% of everything we do every day, but we get the 1% that we keep. Yeah. So hopefully after six months we have 10%. That's awesome. <laughs> and we kind of work from there. So it's just, it's a never ending. We don't wait for the movie to start. We just, you know, it's always, if, if you love it, you're doing it every day. And so we just keep those on. Um, on that note, I think we're very close to the end of the panel, but I know that everyone here might want to see the footage again, so... Let's uh, <laughs> maybe watch it one more time. Can, can you handle another orgasm? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
gentlemen, let's hear it for our final panel of the evening here at Hall H Collider. Directors on directing and our special guests, Tim Miller, Andrew Stankin, Chad Stahelski, and our special guest, Keanu Reeves. Let's hear it for our special guest, Mark.